now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey, guess what? Yeah, once again, it's the Ramble. Like a bad penny, we keep turning up. And I'm Alex, and we'll be here till midnight. Larry Bubbles Brown is a working comic, still to this day a working comic, and he's a good working comic because you're, you're, I think, what some people would describe as a great opening act. Yeah. Yeah. And you are. You're, you're, well, somebody has to take that bullet. <laughs> well, no, I think it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, that you're the perfect, I would think of you as the perfect opening act. And the reason I would think of you as that is because um, you're, um, um, y- you know, you you don't spoil the room. I think that's the... No, even if I did kill, I, I'm still not hard to follow. So. Right. Right, you don't you don't spoil the room, and uh, uh, by spoiling the room, folks, in case people don't know, what spoil what kind of act spoils a room? Uh, someone that's really high energy, maybe does song parodies, and just gets a whole different kind of energy going in the room, and yeah, then it's really hard to follow that song parodies. Yes, or or he just does anything with a guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything, anything with music, will uh, you can't follow. And those guys immediately become the headliners because nobody wants right. to follow them. No one wants to follow. And they them. think it's because of their talent, but it's only because they play a goddamn guitar, you know, or they do magic, or they do something that a ventriloquist pretty hard to follow, aren't they? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who was that? Who was that ventriloquist that we was around for quite a while? Trying to remember, um, Jeff Dunham. That's Jeff it. Dunham made a fortune. What a crazy human being! Just out oh, of really? my fucking mind. Oh, I was at. Uh, I did a. What was it? Some. It, it, it was something. A, a benefit, or a, maybe it might have been a TV show that I was hosting, or something. And um, uh, Jeff Dunham was one of the acts. So uh, finally, they want to take a picture of me with Jeff Dunham and uh, remember that guy who used to take pictures for Bill Graham events the short guy, the midget the guy that he, got run over Yeah, he got run over because the car didn't see him I don't know yeah, I, I don't want to make a horrible I think joke. I got some pictures, he took great pictures yeah. Yeah, he did, took great pictures but they were always kind of looking up at people not straight ahead was his, was oh. his name Randy Bachman? yeah I think so yeah I'm going to get killed for this uh, I, I deserve to die now. Yeah, that was <laughs> Anyway, so I, um, um, uh, so he was taking the picture. And so it's me, and then it's this dummy, and then there's Jeff Dunham. And we're getting ready to take the pictures, and Dunham looks over at me and says, Alex, I understand you don't like ventriloquists. Uh, and um, I, what did I say? I can't remember what I said. It, was that what he said to me? You don't like? I hear you don't like, uh, uh, or uh, prop comics or something like that. And uh, I turned around and looked at him and said, "No, I hate ventriloquists." <laughs> and he didn't didn't bat an eyelash. But the dummy's head turned and looked at me and bared his teeth. Wow. <laughs> Another story I heard was Bobby Slayton is playing some club somewhere in the hinterlands. And all these clubs, folks, used to have a thing called the, the comic uh, apartment or whatever. Rather than put them up in hotels, they just rented an apartment and they would put comics up, right? You know the, yeah. the drill. Because it's, it, well, it's cheaper, okay. It's much cheaper. So anyway, he's staying at this 
comedy condo, as some people like to call them, and he's being housed with a ventriloquist. And he comes back to the apartment, the condo, and there in the living room is the guy, the ventriloquist, watching TV. And he, he's got his dummy next to him. And they're discussing between themselves the oh TV God. show they're watching. <laughs> and I, I, Slayton told me, all he said was, again, it's kind of like a Laurie Thompson line, this is unacceptable. Do not do this while I'm here. Okay? Oh, I, I would have fled, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I guess what you do is you take a childhood thing that is bad, which is probably talking to yourself, and then you turn it into a profession, and that's being a ventriloquist. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then then you have a schizophrenic break, and you yeah, have dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, terrible. Just terrible. So I, I uh, um, you know, I've, I've always been... Uh, I, I've never liked prop comics, and I've not been too fond of ventriloquists, and mainly because they do spoil the room. You shouldn't put them on the same bill together with a stand-up comic. And that's why, for instance, Bob Goldthwaite rose to the top so fast. Nobody wanted to follow this guy screaming. No, I can't, I can't imagine him opening a show. <laughs> you know, um, uh, nobody, wanted to, nobody wanted to go on after Bob Goldthwaite. Not because he was particularly funny, although I have to admit, I used to find him enjoyable, right? Mm -hmm. But, but it, not because he wasn't funny, but because he was, um, how do we put it, just he was, he was loud. He was crazy. He, the, he was manic. And you can't follow that. You can't follow that, no. So immediately he became a headliner. Nobody wanted to follow him. So... And he deserved to be a headliner, but not as fast as he became a headliner. I mean, when he came to San Francisco and he did my radio show, he became a sensation in San Francisco. Am I right or wrong? That was insane, yeah, 1983. I mean, it was like Bob Mania is what it was. It really was, yeah. I mean, I'd hold a show with him, and I'd book him on the show. This is like I used to hold concerts. And the thing would sell out in five minutes. Yeah. The fastest selling show I ever had was, I think we did one at the Circle Star Theater called Bobcat Goes to Hollywood. And uh, because it was just before he was going down to make one of those police movies. And um, the thing sold out in like 10 minutes. I mean, that's how popular this guy was. So, you know, amazing. You were at that show, yeah. weren't you? No, but I heard, uh, I think I've talked about this before, people told me that was the best comedy show they ever saw. It was Warren Thomas, Bob Rubin, Dana Carvey, and uh, Bobcat. Yeah, yeah, that was it. You remember it, you remember it completely, yeah. Yeah, I remember the line. I wasn't there, but I remember the line. Someone told me what a great show that was, and uh, the Circle Star. Yeah. And it was right after he had come back from he just filmed the first Police Academy movie. Yeah. But anyway, um, um, by the way, if people want to go to our uh, Roku channel, I've just put up a whole bunch of new stuff on uh, the Roku channel. And it includes a video I made of backstage stuff at that show. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You got, and you got Dana Carvey there and Warren Thomas. Bobby Slayton. Was Slayton there, too? He just hung out. Slayton was not on the show. No, no. he's not on the show, but he was there. He hung out, I think. I think. I haven't seen it. I haven't watched it again. But, I mean, it really was It was a great show. I, You know, I'm, I'm happy people remember it as being one of the great stand-up shows. Yes, and now the theater's gone. Is it gone? Yeah. Oh, wow. It was right there on the highway. You're right on 101. Yeah. The only reason I held a show there is so I could see my name on the marquee. You know, Alex Bennett presents. <laughs> you know. But uh, I'll tell you the greatest, one of the greatest moments of my life. I'm, I get a job here in New York City. This is my first job in New York. 
at WMCA in New York. And it's every night I go on at, uh, I can't remember when, I, when did I go on in there, I think. God, did I go on at like 2 in the morning or something like that? Yeah. I think, I think you were on like, yeah, all night because didn't Bobby Slayton used to listen to you? He told yeah, me it was like yeah, well, all night. Oh, yeah, you could do all, if people are going, well, gee, you're on that time of night. Is that any good? In New York, you could get a huge audience that time of night, you know, because it's a huge city with a huge population. And But anyway, so one night I'm dr- uh, driving to work. I had, This was a Saturday show I did where I did a, a, a just a talk show with a group of people. Uh, and I'm driving down to go to the uh, to the theater, uh, to the theater, to the station. And as I'm driving down the West Side Highway, on the other side of the West Side Highway was an amusement park called Palisades Park. And they had at Palisades Park this huge kind of Times Square style sign that ran a banner running across it, you know, saying this or that or whatever. And at the precise moment I'm driving down the West Side Highway, I look over, and on this big lit sign was my name. And I went, I made it. You made it. (laughs) You know, I made it. I can look across the Hudson River and I can see my name. So... That was one of the great God, moments of my life. That must have been great. Where it was, do you remember what kind of money you were making? I wasn't making a lot of money. I mean, in fact, I know exactly what I was making because it made, made the front of uh, New York Magazine. What happened every year, New York Magazine would hold what they called their salary edition, and they had the salaries. They found out the salaries of people. And on the cover was me on a bunch of other people, Bill Graham being one of them, by the way, uh, and my picture... And it said twenty nine thousand five hundred dollars. Now in those days, that was not bad money. No, it wasn't big money, but it wasn't bad money. I'll tell you how not big money it was. Also on that same cover was Morris the cat. You remember Morris the cat, the finicky cat the on the finicky tele- cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was on there, and he made as much as I did. So <laughs> I, you know, it wasn't that great a deal. But uh, no, for twenty nine thousand, you could actually live in New York. Oh, oh no, they didn't have Bill Graham there. They had Mickey Ruskin on the cover with me. Yeah, Mickey Ruskin ran uh, uh, Max's Kansas City, which was a very famous bar in the day. Uh, and uh, so uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's a, I, so I know how much money I made because it was on the front of New York Magazine. Otherwise, I wouldn't have remembered. Do you remember? Do you remember your career based on how much money you were making? I can remember what I made. Yeah. You you can like, remem- re- remember what you made, but I'm saying. I can, I can remember how, it, and I quit my day job in '84, and every year the yeah. money got it was more money every year. Up and th- I could see the comedy boom died in '91. That was the first year it went down. <laughs> what was the most then money you ever made in a single night doing a show? Uh, I think twenty five hundred. Really? That's not big. Uh, Where did you make that? That was uh, with uh, Carvey. Mm-hmm. Was that recently? That was uh, up. A- up in Seattle, where some Indian casino is. <laughs> some Indian casino, I yeah. see. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I um, I was hoping you were going to say it was one of my shows, but, yeah. No. Well, you were paid close to that, so. I paid pretty good. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, it, it, the fact was I'm, I'm an entertainer, too, and so I sympathize with an entertainer who's trying to make a living, you know. But... Uh, um, I'll tell you who told me and could remember everything he made at any given time. I interviewed George Burns. And throughout the entire interview, here's how things were going. So where did you first play your first gig? Well, it was in Hackensack, New Jersey, and we were being paid $30 a night. (laughs) And then I'd say, well, what was the 
you know, the best show you've ever done in your life. Well, that was in uh, Cleveland, and I was making two thousand dollars a night. You know, he he everything he related to, he related to is how much money he was making at the time. <laughs> And the only reason that I think he 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 did this was, and, and there's a good reason for it, is that that's what you did in show business in those days. You know, you based everything on how much money you were making. Yeah. Guess how much I was making in Hackensack, New Jersey last week. You know, uh, he 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 related it to how much money he was making at those gigs. So. You should do that. You should say, I remember when I was working with Dana Carvey for $2,500 a week. I'd like to know what those guys get uh, that play like a gigantic arena for one night. Well, they probably get a percentage of the the gate is what they get. You know, Uh, they don't take a flat fee because, you know, if they take a flat fee before they know it, people are raising prices on tickets and they're not reaping the benefits of it. Someone told me what uh, last winter Chappelle and uh, and Chris Rock played the Chase Center here, and someone told me for one night they each made three million, one show. Three million? Mm-hmm. And how big? 20,000 people. And that, some of the tic- the cheapest tickets were 285, and they went up to 1,500. Jeez almighty. God. That's a good night. Yeah. Well, you know, Chappelle's big. He's about as big as you get. Uh, and he is a pure stand-up, which I like, you know. Um, and Rock is great. And Chris Rock, he, he, he'd never been one of my favorites, so I'll tell you why. Um, you know how they say, some people work dirty. You know, you shouldn't work dirty. It's easy to tell a dirty joke, but it's harder to sell a really clean joke. And there are some absolutely clean, squeaky clean comics, Seinfeld being one of them. But the other thing is, is that when you're a black comic, the cheapest laugh you can get is at the expense of white people. And everything with Chris Rock was, you know the trouble with white people these days, blah, 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 blah. And then he does a white, what he considers a white accent and all of that. If I did that about black people, what would happen to me? You know? And yet it's okay if Chris Rock does it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, Chris Rock is funny. But he, there's a lot of racist racism in his jokes. And that's a, that's a problem, I think, personally. Okay. You know? That's just me. I'm sorry. It's, uh, uh, that's the way I am. Uh, because... <laughs> Well, I just, you know, like I watch Bill Maher. Marjorie likes to watch Bill Maher. And he goes, well, I'm not ageist. And then he tells an ageist joke. And I'm I'm getting, I have to admit, I'm getting sensitive to ageist jokes. Yeah, and Bill's not exactly that young himself, is he? Yeah, but it's, but you see, it's easy to make jokes about old people. That's why I watch uh, people doing jokes about Joe Biden. And it's not about his policies or something he screwed up on, it's about the fact that he's old, you know. Well, you know, uh, Joe Biden is so old, uh, but when he goes to bed every night, he has to take Metamucil. Ha, 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 you know. And I'm going, don't they understand this is ageist? You know, they're getting laughs. Uh, uh, Ageism is the one thing you get away with in this uh, PC world. It's, it's it, fun, to uh, make, uh, fun to make fun of old people. Taking advantage of old people is something. Yeah. You, you know, I think they're talking about, uh, well, you know what we got to do to make this country a lot of money? we gotta, we got to cut uh, Social Security. Well, you know, that's the only lifeline some old people have because by the time you're 35, who's going to hire you? Yeah, you can't... Uh, right? Or 65, who's going to hire you? And um, it, it's, you know, it, 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 to begin with, I think we should start uh, Social Security at 55, because at 55, who's going to hire you? I heard it's virtually impossible to get a job if you're over 50. Really? Yeah. So, shouldn't Social Security start then? Yeah. Yeah. I saw a, uh, a black interview about, uh, this was a while ago, but a black woman said that uh, 
the most discrimination she ever faced was not being black, it was ageism. Yeah. And she said they can reject you just they just look at your birth date on the resume be, without even seeing you you get rejected. Yep. Absolutely. So uh anyway, well how old are you again? I keep forgetting. I'm 71. You're 71. How how, how uh, during COVID, how, how 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 much were you happy that you were getting social security? Yeah, we needed it. Yeah. I mean, that kept you going, didn't it? It helped, yeah. Because you weren't working. People weren't going to clubs. That no, we were closed down. Was, that was a real drought. Now, have you saved your money over the years? I Yeah, I never made a lot of money, but I never spent a lot of money either. Yeah, so do you have a nice little nest egg, as it were? Uh, yeah, not, a, not enough to retire but yet, but uh, that's why I'm still working. When but. COVID hit, though. Yeah, you didn't. But COVID hit. We also got out here. I got. I managed to get uh, comics were able to get un- unemployment during COVID. Yeah. Wow. For the whole length of COVID, or for just a couple. E- even self-employed people under COVID qualified for unemployment. Yeah, normally we wouldn't. So. so how much was the unemployment? It was pretty good. It was like uh, the first uh, few months. It was three thousand a month. Really. Yeah, then they cut it. Then they cut it way back. So if you take that three thousand dollars in the beginning and you add your social security into that, I could live on that. Yeah, you could live on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that cheap ass apartment you're in, geez. Yeah, you know, without uh, without uh, with only dial up and no internet. Come on. <laughs> You know what I'm I was do? saving money then. You know what I'm going to do once I once I uh, uh, get this money I'm supposed to get, which I hope I get before I drop dead. Uh, <laughs> I should probably pay for you to have uh, high speed internet. I just pay for it. You you have to have it. I hate it. Well, <laughs> I know what you said to me was, and it. I went and looked it up. By the way, you said to me, and I quote, "The reason I decided not to have." high-speed dial-up after the initial trial period was because one day I found myself looking at a orangutan driving a golf cart. cart. So I looked up the orangutan driving the golf cart. It's pretty funny. (laughs) She's a good driver, (laughs) right? (laughs) Well, all I could think of was it kind of looks like Trump out at one of his golf (laughs) clubs. (laughs) <laughs> but I remember I was like half asleep at three in the morning watching this thing for twenty minutes. What the fuck am I doing? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, nothing terrible with what you were doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you know. I well, saw- before we go, let's uh, say a little uh, uh, farewell to our old friend Richard Lewis. Oh God, you, you, you know, did you know Richard at all? I knew him from, uh, he was on the, the, your show, and I said something he thought was really funny, and I, uh, he was very, I, I went to a couple of shows, and in the green room, he just, one night he said, uh, have a good evening, my friend, I just thought, uh, and he was usually very uh, standoffish with people. He was, was a uh, very, really he was a very. Nice that he said something like that well, to me. Well, I use him as a perfect example of, there are certain people that when they die, all of a sudden, everybody he's on, he's everywhere. It's, he's a headline on the news, and he's you know he makes the evening news and so on. And yet, Richard Lewis, if you think about it, wasn't that successful a comic. He was successful, but he wasn't that successful. Okay, and you you wouldn't imagine that there would be all this about him. But the fact is, so many people loved him, and loved his persona. And so that's what uh, what people were feeling sad about, and yeah, I, you know, I and I agree with. It. I felt very sad about it because he was a nice guy, and um, and I I thought you know a fairly competent comic. I mean, I wouldn't put him in my list of my favorite comics of all time, but if you wanted to list some people who were my favorite comics as people, he would definitely make that list. Yeah, and he, like you said, he wasn't huge, but uh, he was, uh, I think the biggest thing he did was, he had a sitcom with Jamie Lee Curtis. Right, right. And that was probably his high point, but. Yeah, but I mean, he survived, he survived over the years. 
he wasn't the guy who did comedy and it didn't work out for him, so he went and sold cars. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he he kept doing it and doing it and doing it. I mean, I remember when I first saw him, I thought he was kind of a eh, cheap version of Woody Allen because his delivery was a lot like Woody Allen's. But as the years went on, I came to appreciate him for what a really solid comic he was. Yeah. But forget about how good a comic he was. This was a nice guy, you know. And there's no one who knew him that wouldn't agree with me, you know. Mm -hmm. So... It was really kind of sad. Very sad. And on that... Alex Bennett is still alive? Now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. All right. <laughs> you didn't get the last, like, ten seconds of bubbles. I accidentally... What it is, I... I, I um, I put my hand over here, and then I accidentally hit a hit a space bar. And if you hit a space bar here, let me turn this on here. Uh, you turn on a space bar, uh, it uh, it goes. You know, like here. You want to see the beginning of something? Let's see here. Um, hmm. Well, I haven't got that set up, but anyway, you hit a space bar, and it, it changes. Okay. So I screwed up the very ending, but you got it, didn't you? Okay, and then we got some kind of picture or something up there. Uh, it's just, it's weird, weird, very weird, weird. Anyway, hello everybody, how are you? Uh, this is uh, the uh, the Ramble, we go until midnight tonight, uh, and usually tons of people are calling, but uh, I only got one person waiting right now. You know, I threaten this a lot, but I'm getting to the point where I'm beginning to think, you know, I've got to rethink uh, how I do this show because if people don't uh, want to participate in it, then uh, what the fuck am I doing it for? I, you know, I get to that point, and I also, you know, you say, well, why do you always say you're going to quit when, you, when there's nobody calling and blah, 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 and then you never do it, and I never do it because of the few people that do call who really enjoy it, and I kind of like talking to them, okay? So that's why I keep doing it. But, you know, I mean, I don't have to keep doing it. Nobody's told me this is what I have to do for a living. Uh, and I can always change the nature of how we do this show. So uh, if we don't start getting better participation, um, you know, the Monday show, for instance, that we do, great participation, just terrific. You know, we always have at least maybe close to 15 people on. That's about as much as I want anyway. Uh, but anyway, so I, you know, I just, um, let me move myself up here. There we go. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't know. It just uh, kind of depresses me, you know. But let me, uh, we have one person here and uh, one only. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, here he comes. We'll bring him on. And uh, let's see here. Are we going to get him? Okay. Are we going to get him? There he is. Hey, hi, Josh. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm okay. You know, uh, nobody's calling tonight, which is not fun. But, eh, what the hell? How how you doing? I'm all right. You know. Uh, Will, what we should do is we just threaten that if they don't call, you'll do like a, uh, a one-hour course on George Washington. Yeah. Yeah. Good. You know, and I can just sit back here and do nothing, uh, you know. And uh, we'll at least uh, be doing something educational. Yeah. And you could probably do it, couldn't you? Uh, probably do an hour if I needed to, yeah. You could do an hour on uh, on George Washington, could you? Yeah, Probably. He was uh, interesting, an interesting guy. Uh, would he have been, uh, if let's say he was a second or third president, hmm. would he be on a dollar? Would he be on be on, on the coins and on the on the the dollars mm -hmm. and so on? I don't know. It's a good question. Maybe not. Um, although the, you know, a few of the early presidents were very popular 
uh, like Jefferson, for example. So, I mean, there was certainly still the ability for him to be, you know, well-known, famous, well-loved, even though if he had not been the first president, you know, but probably not the same level of prestige. Well, well what, I'm, what, I, what I'm thinking of is um, I often used to say, I have a joke about uh, people say to me, well, uh, uh, do you remember the first time he had sex? And I said, yes. And people would say, well, how good was it? And I used to say, well, it was the best I ever had. You know, uh, and and it's the same thing with George Washington. I mean, he was the first president, so I guess he was the best president we ever had up to that point. Yeah. Well, up to that point, yeah. So but, we were, uh, you know, I mean, he was a bit great general. He was very important in the formation of this country. Mm -hmm. um, why? Uh, why was he? Why was he made president over anybody else? Did they? Was he the most liked guy or what? Well, he was certainly the most uh, popular and the most admired individual in the country at the time. He was, you know, sort of the original celebrity. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I mean, he was made president because he was elected. But the reason that he was elected is because almost unanimously people loved him. Uh, for the things that he had done, but also for some of the things that he had not, not done or, you know, actions that he had taken and, and things like that. You know, um, his leadership had been very strong. People came to see him as a very moral uh, individual, um, uh, a responsible person, you know, who would do the right thing even when people were not looking. Mm-hmm a man of integrity and things like that. Now, I understand that in modern times, you're going to get the what about this, what about that type of stuff. Well, you it's know. usually slavery, right? Sure, correct. Um, first and foremost, absolutely. You know, so that is an understandable uh, line of questions um, that, you know, deserve answers. And, you know, those things certainly existed. Uh, but at the time that he lived, you, you know, those things were in existence. He was born into and placed into a system uh, where they existed and where that was basically the livelihood that was, you know, expected of him, handed down to him, you know, that he that he came into in a way. Um, well, isn't also the reason why you had slaves in those days was it was just an economic thing? Well, that, that, I mean, yes. I mean, I mean the, you, you owned the economy. The economy of the of the time, certainly in the area uh, of the country that he was from, was predicated upon it. And I guess it's what I was getting at was, you know, what I'm saying is, at the time that the people voted for him, the things that we now look at and say, well, what about this? What about that? Those things weren't really on their mind. You know, they were they were widely accepted. I mean, people living pretty much all over the country, they didn't think uh, they didn't vote for president than the people themselves. But let's say they had, you know, they didn't look at it and say, well, Washington's great, but, you know, he's got this slavery thing and I don't I don't like that. So I can't vote for him. No one really thought about it, you well, know. I mean, I mean uh, you had uh, some religious organizations, some Quakers, some things like that that recognized that slavery was obviously, in their mind, wrong. They got it right from the beginning, okay? But you're, this is a very, very tiny portion of the population. Wasn't Benjamin Franklin a Quaker? Uh, I, You know, not. he didn't really practice religion okay. um, much at all. Uh but he had some roots within that, um, although he was not really, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin was as to Quakerism as to you maybe are Jewish, you know, mm -hmm. if that makes yeah. sense, okay. you know. Yeah. I mean, in, in other words, as far as I know, you don't attend temple, you don't, right? you, you know, right, you know, so kind of the same thing for him. But... You know, that, that's the yeah. thing. I mean, Washington was just, you know, look, he was seen as, 
you know, obviously mm -hmm. he got all the things that went along with a military leader who comes out as victorious. People throughout history, right, mm -hmm. have always liked military leaders who uh, who achieve victory, okay? Mm -hmm. So he got all of that. That's like, you know, enough said type of situation. But he had done a lot of other things that the people who were going to choose noticed, uh, you know, acts of integrity and a strong fight for, you know, a Republican form of government and some things like mm -hmm. that, you know, over the years. And he'd been very consistent about it and things. So he was basically a unanimous choice, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, on record, he was unanimous. Yeah. But, I mean, even in the minds of the people, he was unanimous. Let me just bring in Amy Manuel. Hello, Amy. Why are you calling? You never call this show. Well, your microphone isn't working. You haven't got your microphone working. Working it out. See, what happened is she went, she went somewhere else and she's going to do her show tonight mm -hmm. off, a, uh, off a, um, a laptop. But she didn't uh, say, hey, let's fix this up and let's get it going like at 3 o'clock this afternoon. She just started getting a hold of me about 20 minutes ago. Well, she's, tr she's trying it now. That's okay. So if she doesn't have a show tonight, folks, that's why. You know. Yeah. You, you're, you don't have any audio? You, you can't hear it. Can you hear me? You can hear me. She can hear us. So uh, do you know how to use Zoom well? Hmm. Yeah, do you know how to go to where the audio is? She's getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If she learns sign language, it'll be okay. She can work on it while we chat or whatever. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm trying to do a show here is what I'm trying to do, you know. So need be we'll we'll fill in, carry on. <laughs> yeah, but you're you know, nobody's calling tonight for some reason, and so the fact that you're even there is a is a godsend, you know. <laughs> so but no, what I was gonna say about George Washington was is that uh he was the best we had ever had to that point. Now he was not elected by the people, was he? He was elected by the Continental Congress, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Well, at that time, we would have called it, you know, it was regular Congress. The government was constituted. Yeah. At that time, um, but yeah, there were not direct elections for president by the general population the way that uh, there is now. Yeah. You know, it was elected then under the original system of the Electoral College, um, where the electors, you know, uh, voted and sent that word to Congress, who then, you know, verified it and all that. So you want all the electoral votes, uh, you know, and, you know, swept in and, and, and just kind of took off from the beginning. I mean, that's the thing I was saying. He was just... I can't think really of anyone else that the lawmakers and the people would have trusted or entrusted with that job at that time because, you know, everything was brand new and it had to be set up. And, you know, they just trusted him to set it up and work it out. I mean, don't get me wrong, we have a constitution, uh, we have it written down, and that's a roadmap. But look, we still argue over the Constitution today, right? Right. But let so me, let's, let me, not act yeah. like, let's not act like it's always 100% clear-cut, A, B, C, do this. Do, you know, questions came up then just as now. You know, well, what about this and what about that? But let me, let me, a, let me ask you, you know? this. Uh, um, can I, you hear me now? Yeah, mm -hmm. now we can hear you. And I can hear you. Mm -hmm. My earbuds are now working. I'm not going to have a show because the mixer that I got from Jax, I can't get the computer to recognize it. Well, you, and see, you should have tested this all while you were at home. I should have, yeah. but yeah, I didn't. I was tired yesterday. By the time I had all the right pieces together, it, I was just tired. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's on me. Yeah, yeah, it's on you. Anyway, um, uh, you, you gonna stick around here, or are you just gonna? 
Sure, I'll, I'll stick around. I had nothing better to do. Yeah, apparently other people had something better to do because they're not here tonight. So, uh, But anyway, uh, well, I, the thing I wanted to ask you is, didn't they originally want to make George Washington king? Wasn't that going to be the name of the of the of the job? No, I, I don't. I mean, I don't think that was the idea of most or very many. But don't get me wrong; there was a small contingent of individuals here and there that thought a return to monarchy was going to be a good idea, and that the monarch should be Washington. But the, the reasons for this were the fact that most of these people who thought this was a good idea, okay, this was not the common people uh, for the most part. This would have been government leaders and mostly military leaders who had been treated unfairly for quite a while mm -hmm. at the end of the Revolutionary War because the government didn't have any money. So what you had was you had a group of people who didn't, you know, they didn't get paid for over a year, um, really longer. They had been promised pensions. They didn't see any hope of those pensions coming through because they couldn't even pay them now. Why would they pay us later? Yeah. And then in lieu of the pensions or the pay, they thought they would take land in what was then the Ohio Territory on the other side of the Appalachians, and they could just be given land and homesteads and things like that. But the government was so poorly functioning, and we hadn't even settled the war completely yet, that that was our land, but yet it wasn't our land. So it's hard to give away something that you also don't own. So people thought that the government as it existed under the Articles of Confederation was weak and that it was doing a terrible job, that the Continental Congress had been weak. The Articles of Confederation did almost nothing to fix any of those problems. It only made them worse. They were right. But they thought, therefore, you know, what we need is a strong government. And we look around the world in our time and our place, and we, all the strong governments we see are monarchies. So let's go back to Let's go to a, a monarchy. We'll just separate ourselves from England. Check mark. That's done. Mm -hmm. We got that. Now we'll just constitute our own monarch. And, you know, as I said, who who would people want to be the monarch if we were going to have one? Well, it would be Washington. Well, how much of the formation of this country was uh, formed in selfishness? In other words, a desire to get away from England so as to be able to have uh, your own little backyard to make money in. Well, you, I mean, a lot of them, yeah. a lot of the motivation certainly was personal. I mean, was I mean, it was it that they so hated having a king that they wanted to get rid of this horrible person, or was it just that they wanted him out of the way so they could have the whole country to themselves? I think it was really more so that they wanted to right to control their own destiny, mm -hmm. and they wanted that destiny to be predicated upon their own work mm -hmm. and their own worth and decisions and the monarchy that they existed in didn't really give them the ability to do that because America, the colonies, were seen as sort of subservient to England mm -hmm. and as, you know, a... Well, so, so England felt they had a right to this place. Well, sure, they, they did. They did have a right. I mean, it was a colony, you know. I mean, uh, colonists viewed themselves in almost every way as Englishmen, you know, mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, but they, the more they got the point about, you know, they, they felt they were second-class citizens, it, you know, if you will. They were Englishmen in name only, these kinds of things. You know, it, it built up over time. But a lot of it was personal motivation to... But see, that makes it sound bad as if it was, you know, greed and things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way it was, but don't we, I mean, it's no different again than now. Don't we all have that? We all want to be able to move up and do better and do what we want and right. all those right. kinds of things. And they did see that a government that was far, far away didn't understand their needs. They didn't understand this place. If 
even when they did understand it, they didn't care because it was inconvenient for England, you know, for mm -hmm. the for the empire. Um, you know, they they said, you know, when we propose something, they look at how it affects the empire. We only look at how it affects us. We don't care how it affects the empire and, you know, South Asia or India or any of the other places that they they deal with. We 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 have right. our own problems here and we need solutions we don't look at it through that lens right so it was very self-motivated and things Let now, me i just... think where it got out of hand was some of those things were were taken by people who were very good at propaganda like the sons of liberty and all these organizations the committee of safeties and everything and they could take the littlest tiniest thing that really England was legitimate to ask for or whatever, and they could just turn that into a PR campaign yeah. that just made people go crazy. I mean, they were like the original Fox News. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So Anyway, anyway by the way, let me uh, in, in, say hello to Tom Yamaguchi. Hello, Tom. How are you? Hi. Interesting Hi, conversation here. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, you know, I, I, I just think that we... You know, we idolize the beginning of this country and uh, hold it up to such, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, but, you esteem. know, I, esteem. But I don't know that it was entirely all that. I mean, I think there were, there was, there were a lot of politics going on, right? You know, and certain people wanted it a certain way and certain people wanted it another way. If I were there, I would have said, no capitalism. I'm sorry, no capitalism. Forget it. It's, you're going to find out later on down the line, it's really going to screw you over. You know? Uh, and uh, were there people that were socialists at that time? I mean, that basically had that idea of, uh, well, well, if, if you want to talk about communal activities, communism, what were the pilgrims? I mean, they were well, communal. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think they were capitalist at heart, but economic theory was certainly, you know, it wasn't as developed, you know, as it was as it is now, you know, because things then again, you know, like I said, when we set up our country, I mean, we were the the first to to do such a thing, you know, to yeah to choose how and who to govern ourselves, you know. I mean, it, it was crazy. So I guess I'll let everybody else say what they want, but I would just point out, you know, your point about how... Well, we, we did have we did it. have a blank slate, after all. Yeah, but like how we sort of hold it in highest... Well, I mean, we're not really the first. The, the, Greek were the, uh, the Greeks were the first. They, they had right. a representative government mm -hmm. before us. And, and no place is purely socialist, no place is purely communist, no place is purely capitalist. It's, it's pretty much everywhere in the world, it's some sort of combination of the above, mm -hmm. including dictatorships and monarchies. They're all some sort of combination of different things. You know, we've, we've got fire departments and police departments and parks and rec and all that, and all that socialism. Our streets are socialist. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we all participate in socialism every single day. So I think my point on, you know, their line of thinking around that when, when they when they set it up was of course they were aware of some of, you know, like ancient history, the Greeks, etc. But you know, at the time they set up our system of government and they looked around the world. I mean, this was pretty, this is a pretty radical idea. You know, mm -hmm. look, England, are the most powerful countries, England, monarchy, France, monarchy, Maine, monarchy. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, they just, you know, they look around and no one was doing it that way. But to what you were saying a minute ago, you know, with Amy was, you know, don't we kind of idolize it and, you know, hold it in high esteem and everything? And we kind of do, you know, but I would say at least to their credit, those folks, you know, they did, they really didn't. I mean, when they put pen to paper, you know, they were like, I don't know if this is going to work. They were pretty let, nervous. Yeah. Let me go to another another slight subject here, because we were talking about the pilgrims. We all know the story about uh, Pocahontas. OK. <laughs> Do you know what happened to Pocahontas? Um, 
Didn't she? Wasn't she sort of a slave and no, and a bit. So far as I know, from history, she went to Europe. Yeah, and became a celebrity. And a Christian. And a Christian. She became a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. So so much for that legend. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I I mean. Much all of our turn our it, turn down your mic turn it down your microphone a little bit okay right. if you can do it because right. it, right. it, it's a little on the loud side and it pierces through. Uh, right. yeah. Oh, here comes Alan. Gee, nice of Alan to show up finally. You know. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh d- no! Pre- yeah, I just uh, pre- it pretend was, like it was... he's not there. Okay. You know, I would, uh, but I think that's a good point for people, you know, to think about or remember though, is, I mean, you know, even at the, even at the constitutional convention, you know, when it was over, I mean, I think everyone felt great. We did a really great thing. You know, this is awesome. The country's been in trouble since the war. We finally got to fix it all. And then, but then they were kind of also looking at each other like, I don't know, did we? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, we, we're taking a stab at it, but I mean, a lot of them thought, I don't know, in 10 years, are we going to be right back here in the same building looking for the new, well, different answers to the same old questions? Well, I mean, you know, we think that they, they, they created a perfect system. We like to believe that. But, yeah. you know, I mean, come on, if it were a perfect system, we wouldn't have had to write any more uh, amendments to the Constitution. Well, I mean, no, that, I I ooh. don't think I don't think that they were thinking that they were creating a perfect system, because of all the compromises they were making, including uh, kicking the slavery issue down the road. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there are a lot of compromises. You know, I mean, when you look at even the electoral college, uh, and there was always this this tension between the big states and the small states, and the small states fe- they fe- fearing of being eaten up and being dominated by the mm-hmm. big states and, and demanding to have a bigger piece of the pie. So I don't think they're, they, they, they went thinking they had something perfect. In fact, it just came back in their face and in the terms of, of, of the Bill of Rights, they had to come up with even a bunch of, of amendments before the states would even buy it. So, well, I think what, like, but like what Alex was saying is I think he said, we, tend to think that way you know i think he's you're thinking you know we as in our current generation or whatever we sort of lionize them for it right but they definitely they definitely didn't think that i mean they i mean i'm serious i mean i i think if if they had if the 55 guys who signed at the end of the convention if you had taken a a poll you know um and you would have said 20 years from now Will this document still be in place, or will we have replaced it? I think you'd have gotten fifty-fifty. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm serious. I well, think, did, did wasn't wasn't you know, wasn't Jefferson a believer? Or didn't he say at one point that about every fifty years the country should completely change itself? Well, I don't know if those were his exact words. I mean, I think yeah. that the people who like to change things like to you know throw around his quote that you know. The government should be redone uh, as as the people see needed, and you know the tree of liberty should be watered with the blood of tyrants from time to time, <laughs> and those those kinds of things, you know. But you know, I've said before that the some of the point of this is that everything was so volatile and was changing so quickly, and no one was really sure about it because they had none of the information that we have now. They didn't see what was working and what didn't. I mean, I think I've said this before, when it comes to, you know, many of the framers, people can go pick out a quote and say, this is what so-and-so said, and that's why today it's this, that, and the other. And I can almost no, guarantee well, I'll you, tell you where they made just the, give me a half uh, an hour, I can go find you another quote that almost says exactly. I'll tell you the biggest mistake they made uh, uh, that I can think of when they were creating the Constitution is there wasn't an amendment banning TikTok. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Back in 2006, I think it was, 
there was a HBO special called Assume the Position with Robert Wool. Mm -hmm. and, and then there was a sequel to it. That show talks about our history is the stories we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. And for example, it, it, he talked about the, the legend of Paul Revere. Well, the guy that, you know, Paul Revere like rode across town. Whereas the guy that did the actual ride was uh, Theodore Bissell. Yeah. A Bush guy. And, uh, but, but, um, Paul Revere, just like Columbus, had a really good author that wrote a really good story for him. Well, yeah. there's an old. Yeah, good uh, PR. Yeah. There, there <laughs> was a, good, he had a good publicist. There was a movie many years ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it right now. Um, but, oh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, was that it? Uh, but yeah, yeah, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. And the end of the, end of the thing is uh, they say, well, you know, this isn't really how it went down. And the reporter says to him, when it's the difference between the truth and myth, print the myth. You know, and, and, and that's what we have a tendency to do is print the myth. I mean, all these things, like Paul Revere. The only reason we, we remember Paul Revere is somebody wrote a poem about it, you know. Um, they might write of Paul Revere, to, it, but the minute they write of Theodore yeah. Bissell doesn't sound like that. <laughs> right. There's also another guy named Dawes, too, that wrote, too. William Most Dawes, yeah. Released, yeah. Yeah, I think there were at least a couple others that went out and did the same thing. In fact, yeah, I think William Dawes also did that ride. Yeah, he was, uh, I remember the name now. Do yeah. you remember the name, uh, uh, Josh? Yeah. William yeah. Dawes, yeah. yeah. So, I mean. Many, uh, people, uh, many people did those kinds of things, you know, yeah. um, including on that exact, you know, time frame. So, that you know, that was the point is what we were talking well, let's about. Say, let's say, let's yeah. say for the sake of argument here, that everything, all the little myths and everything are kind of true and everything was done really for just reasons when they did it. And um, they created this country with a certain expectation of what it could become. What do you think, if they were still around or if they still had the ability to communicate with us, would they think of what they created and what it had become? I mean, they can't have even imagined what we are using right now with the internet and with video and being able to talk to people all over the planet at the same time. Yeah, well, I mean, they, yeah, them. but but but, <laughs> but forget about that. I mean, that the, here are a bunch of people sitting around all claiming to be interpreting the Constitution. They always hold this piece of paper up like it's it's, it's almost more hallowed in this country than the Bible. OK, you know. And, and except that they don't want it when it doesn't suit their, you know, that, that, you know. it's a tool you, to be used when they want it. Yeah, exactly. Actually, it's a sledgehammer to be used when they yeah. want it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's only used when the, when it works in their own favor. Well, you know, also, I mean, how it, it, I'd like to think the Constitution was a perfect document. But if it was so perfect, why are we still arguing about, like, the Second Amendment and what it means? Because in some ways it's so vague that, you know, I mean, uh, it, it doesn't make much sense. Well, they, didn't have, they didn't envision AR-15s and everybody having them well, and having a police department and, and a, a sheriff's department and a National Guard and an army and a navy and an air force and marines. Well, you know, in those you know. in those days, <laughs> what a gun did yeah. is you uh, you uh, took a big ram ramrodding thing and you uh, you put some a wad of something yeah. in there, and then you had to put another thing in there, and then you had to put another thing in there. And by the time you did all that, which took about five minutes, you press the uh, the trigger and you shot the bullet. Uh, today they'd be dead, <laughs> you know, before they even got to the. <laughs> Shooting of the wrong. weapon. Isn't it a foundation I think the Second document? Amendment means. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the Second Amendment means that everyone has a right to a musket. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, no, in order to maintain a well ordered militia, 
Right. Okay. Exactly. Uh, if they're yes, in, what, what, say, what, what, the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, mm -hmm. Police Department. What were you saying, you Kevin? <laughs> Kevin? No, I was just saying that, you know, it should be in, I would think that it should have been interpreted as a foundational document, you know, to to be interpreted along the way as time changes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't. You know, it's the basis of it should be kept intact, but probably amended by, but, but the problem is uh, it can be, and, mm -hmm. and it's just that nobody agrees on how to do it. I don't think, I mean, I should say I don't think, I'm positive. You wouldn't find anyone uh, from the from the era, uh, it, it, from the convention, any of its biggest supporters, anything like that. No one, none of them would claim it was a perfect document, guaranteed. Right. If I have heard very few people ever, you know, make that argument, um, except for people that were, you know, just not correct, in my opinion. You know, and they argued pops, about it back then. Right, crackpots mm -hmm. or whatever. So none of them would claim it. As to some of the issues, I think Kevin is right. I mean, I think their argument, and I agree with it, would be, Hey, I've morphed into this new this society 250 years later, and this is great. You know, the country is the most powerful country in the world. It it's succeeding. It's prosperous. You know, uh, it it's growing all the time. These things are great, and you guys have these complaints, and you're coming to me and you're saying, "Look what you guys wrote here." And you know, this doesn't this isn't working for us and everything. And I think they would just be like, did you not think to change it? I mean, we never told you that you couldn't. As a matter of fact, we explained. Well, I'm wondering if, if, if they came. That you should. If, if they could look in on us today, okay, as an example. If they mm. could look in on us today, uh, would they then look at the rest of the world and say, England still got a king? <laughs> I mean, but it goes back to the it goes back to the fact that you just said a few minutes ago we said that they hold it up and use it as a tool, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you want to change it, everybody has to agree on what the change is. And if they're holding it up as a tool, or well, I, you know, the, the Second Amendment, you have to agree on what you're going to change in it, and you're not. Well, they and also they also one is holding it up because of this, and one is holding it up because of that. No one's going to agree on how to change it, so they just leave it alone. And it remains a stale well, document. Well, they, they think of it as an absolutely perfect document. And the it's fact not. is that I there mean, are things in there that are antiquated, you know? Sure, but you gotta you got to amend it, and you have to have agreement on amendments. Oh, we, do we never be it. Do you think we'd be able to exactly do that today? Exactly my point. I mean, that's the reason. I mean, it's we're still lucky we're still is. here, you know? Uh, right. Women and that's didn't why it's get still the, the right same to vote. Is. Women didn't get the right to vote until 1921. Well, that, that wasn't a bad idea. Okay. <laughs> and there's a guy I mean, running for governor. There's, there's a guy running for governor. It was like the 1960s before we yeah, could have credit. Or, yeah. There's, yeah. there's a guy running for governor in North Carolina that does believe it's a bad idea for women to vote. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I just saw there's a great, there. there's I mean, a great there's a great documentary on PBS this week on American Experience about... Um, airline stewardesses and how they were in the forefront of Light most attendance. of the women's movement in this country mm -hmm. and they were the ones that went on strike and asked for equal pay and asked for equal opportunity and it's a very it's two hours long but it's just fascinating <laughs> on how you wouldn't think that that you never think of stewardesses as being a, a radical group of people and really that they did more to change the rights of women in this country than any almost single group of people, you know. And uh, uh, going back into the 40s, I think they were striking. They were doing things like that, you know. So it's, it's a great documentary if you get a chance to, to watch it. So I was just, I mean, I was just going to say that, you know, at least, like I said, in, in my opinion, you know, none none of the people from the era would represent it as perfect. I mean, I don't I don't know. I mean, do I don't feel like I hear a lot of people making that argument now. I mean, do you think a lot of people make the argument now that it's a perfect system or anything? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I 
Oh, there are people who say the, the Constitution is the most perfect document ever made, you know, and, and uh, we, it, we should take it. It should be just exactly what it says there. And I go, you go, no, it's not. Well, you know, it, it, I mean, but I think that's only when they want it, when they're fighting for what they're fighting for. If you turn something else on them, they'll probably turn around and say, oh, well, well, that, that, well, that the, isn't right. Well, the people say, well, we, we've got to fight to preserve the Constitution are usually the people who are the least constitutional. Exactly. You know, exactly. That's the problem. And, and they use it as a Texas. weapon. They use it as a weapon. Yes. Uh, uh, so that's uh, For example, perfect. the Supreme Court made a decision telling Abbott that he had to remove the razor wire, and he didn't. He put up more. So, you know, they're all about the Constitution, except when they don't like what it says. Well, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm one of these people that feels that uh, this country doesn't have much longer to last in its current state. Okay? Uh, it's too divided. You know? A country divided against itself cannot stand. And I think that's what's starting to happen here. Rather than it's saying to each other that the most, the most wonderful thing we can do for this country... <laughs> is to be uh, 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 together and solve our problems together and deal with things together. But if we separate you have to have into people willing to. But when you get so divisive like we are now, that can that'll destroy America. You know? Uh, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me, Josh, but, uh, you know. Well, I don't... Um... I mean, I would say no. You know, I, I don't think we're at uh, that low of a point. Um, I mean, I think we have problems, and I think the political scene is very ugly and unnecessarily so, and it's being driven, you know, by some terrible people and things. But I think we've certainly been at, at lower points and still not only survived but accomplished great things and thrive and and i don't even just mean you know the civil war for example which was obviously much worse of a time than than we're living in now but i mean you know look at just this country uh this country won I'm world right war there world war ii for example with a segregated military and you know no rights for people of color and women and you know things of that nature and, and you know jim crow and race riots and all that and was still able to you know accomplish what it did in in europe and in asia and then in the space race and all that so i mean we have these issues and we have this division but are still very capable and very prosperous and you know i don't feel like we're on the brink of something worse than what we've faced before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're at a very low point politically, but not necessarily nationally, you know? So, well, I guess. By the way, uh, we've been joined by, joined by Charlie. We should mention that. I didn't... Hello, Charlie. And, and Hi, Kevin. Kevin. Well, Kevin, we've been talking to. We haven't talked to Charlie. I haven't said hello to Alan. <laughs> <clears throat> well, there's a, a reason. There's a, re he came on. there's a reason for that. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> get used to it. Um, well, I would say that we are definitely in, in uncharted waters uh, because of the way the two pol made major political parties are acting. And, and I don't know if you heard the news today. Uh, Mike Pence came out. He yes. says he's not supporting Trump. He's not going to vote for Trump. Oh, he's he Wow. Yeah. He's not supporting Trump. Yeah. So. You mean this... he's finally not going to support the the guy that tried to get him killed? Right. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, well, I'll, I'll tell, tell you. Yeah, finally, the, the notion finally it's came wrong. into his I'll tell you something. I have a certain amount of respect for Pence. I mean, I think he's kind of a douche in a lot of ways. But uh, I, I have to give him credit because you have to understand when you're vice president, your job is to be the president's butt boy, okay? They, they, I've never known a vice president that hasn't been totally loyal to the president. Am I right, Josh? Where they just, you know, say, defend the president, defend what he's doing, and so on. But now that he's no longer president, 
a vice president rather, that's not his job anymore. His job now is to, as a citizen who uh, doesn't hold any political office, is to uh, uh, perhaps say what he feels is best for America. And he, he just doesn't feel that Trump is, uh, is up to the job. I think the reason, his main reason, is that the way Trump acted after he lost the election, he felt was just abominable. Yes, uh, Alan. Uh, didn't Biden have to sign a form that when he ran uh, for a president and and pulled out that he had to back whoever was the nominee, like Trump? Well, they may both, uh, both parties. Both parties. Said, I don't know if the Democrats do that, but the Republicans were doing it. If you wanted to be in the debate, yeah. you had to sign a thing saying you would. Uh, uh, you would uh, uh, support, support the, the nominee. Uh, yeah. The, and, event, and, the and, nominee, and, which is why Trump was not in any of the debates. Yeah. Because he wouldn't agree to back the nominee if it wasn't him. Yeah, but also the guy who signed one of those was, was Pence when he was running for president. Right. right. Uh, right. But, I but I give him credit mm -hmm. for saying, to hell with that. You know, I, I just can't vote for this man, I can't vote for what he has become. He said, you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was, uh, I'm glad you brought it up because that was a very telling thing today. I don't know, uh, how, is any, how is it going to affect uh, Trump's uh, presidency or his bid for the presidency? Well, well, what I'm thinking is, well, we have we have two possibilities. I mean, one, of course, is that Trump gets reelected in a fluke. You know, I can't see him getting, getting the popular vote ever, but but you know his best chance is with the uh, with the electoral vote, and if he gets enough, you know sh the same kind of shenanigans he tried to pull on on January sixth, you know, with the state legislatures, you know, there's a possibility that that he could get into power that way. But the other possibility is that he totally implodes, and the Republican Party implodes with him. Well, and well, so I, then I, yeah. we have a situation where we have a one party system, which in this country doesn't last for long. When one party implodes, then the well, other party or the remaining party splits. If you do this. So we end up with. Well, so yeah. so the, the, the system sort of gets back into. It'll recreate well, well, things, You things, know, we, yeah, we don't but, have but, a Whig party yeah, anymore. Let me, let me say something here. Too bad, too, because I'm a Whig. <laughs> you are, aren't you? I am a Whig. No, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Whig in spirit for my late housemate, Bob, who uh, Monday would have been uh, 75 years old oh, uh, this wow. coming Monday, so, wow. but we lost him. Well, anyway, uh, the thing is that uh, um, uh, now, now I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry about so, that. Because <laughs> everybody else was talking at the same time and I forgot, so. Sorry. But, uh, it, oh. it, you know, I mean, the fact of the matter is is that you've got, uh, uh, I, oh, I know what it was. The reason I, I, I had a feeling, oh, Biden's in trouble. And everybody goes, Biden, it's too, it's touch and go. Right. And I don't think it is touch and go. I think if you start doing the no, math. He's up in the polls now. Well, no, but if you do do the math, OK, uh, forget about the polls, but do the math. Uh, Nikki Haley ran against Trump. On the average, she got about 40 percent of the vote. That 60 percent isn't like all the Republicans agreeing with you, Donald. Forty percent mm -hmm. went with Nikki Haley mostly because they didn't want you. Right. So where are those yes. people going to go now? You know, mm -hmm. JFK oh, Jr.? A good portion of them said they would not vote for yeah. Trump yeah. if he became the non nominee. A good percentage of the, Nikki yeah, Haley but voters. The, but the fact is, uh, you know, where, 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 where are they going to go? Uh, RFK Jr.? Come on, do you really want uh, Jesse Ventura as your vice president or Aaron no, Rodgers? No, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there are two of them that if, if, say he's thinking of. The fact yeah. that he's thinking of either of those people just codifies my belief that RFK Jr. is a crazy ass. Okay, so, you know, and I don't, you know, care who well, he well, that's a couple of my sisters. <laughs> yeah. But, one of the things that uh, that RFK Jr. said and why he might choose uh, Aaron Rodgers is, is because he's battle-tested. And I say, well, in that case, actually... 
even more than Rogers, he should take Donald Trump as his running mate because Trump knows how to run out the clock. Well, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I just have um, um, a feeling that that um, it's just not going to be easy for Trump to win this one. I think he's destroying himself. He's so divided yeah. his party that he's not going to. He thinks he's go. Oh, I, I won all these things. I got the nomination and everything. Yeah, but you only you didn't get it with more than sixty percent, and that's the well, problem. Uh, on top of that, on uh, add to that that all the people testifying against Trump in the four felony cases and, and what is it now eighty five counts. 91. Felony count? 91. Yeah, but no, six of them were oh, set aside. Okay. Gee, it's down. Right. Oh, God. You mean to tell oh. me it's down to 85? <laughs> right. Oh, gee, we're losing this thing now. 85 counts, huh? So, almost all of the people testifying against him are Republicans, and a good portion of them either worked for him or we're in his administration. Listen, I'm telling you now, the one thing that Donald Trump loses sleep over is the trial that's already over. That one that he has to pay almost a half a billion dollars mm -hmm. to either appeal, at the very least, or pay off the judgment. That's going to ruin him, going to ruin his company, his business, and his reputation. That's the one I bet he doesn't get sleep. He loses sleep over, you know. I don't think he cares about all these others. He figures he can keep his lawyers juggling the balls in the air and, you know, keep it. Well, you, know. you know, a lot of people have already gone to prison. <laughs> have gone to what? Prison. 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 Oh, prison. Yeah. 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 Especially over, you know, a lot of the heads of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and the uh, Three Percenters. A lot of those guys that run those organizations are already he serving always prison demanded, terms. He always demanded loyalty from everybody. It was the big thing. You know, it's like the godfather. You gotta, I gave none. Uh, you, you know, and my question is, how much loyalty did he give his people? How many of them went broke because of this? Look at Rudy Giuliani. doesn't have a penny to his name. Is yeah. a chance he's going to go to jail. And do you think Trump says, hey... Here, here's some money, even out of my out of my um, funds that people are giving me. Here, here's some money to take care of yourself in this deal. No, no, he abandoned every he last one of them. <laughs> and, that, and you know who's paying his legal bills? Well, his is the Russian. Well, the Russian. I, I don't. I don't believe that. But don't it's believe just, it Chubb. Chubb is a Russian organization, Chubb Insurance. And I'm not buying look, don't, don't please pay, please Amy, don't start with the the, the conspiracy theories. Right. You know it's it, not a conspiracy theory. It, it, well it is. New. I how it many happened. people how many people not, have women how many people how many how many people have heard what she's talking about? I haven't. No. I haven't. You have but, Charlie? Uh yeah. Yeah. It's it was well reported. I well, never. Heard, if it was happen. well reported, I never heard it, and I listen yeah. to the news. Trump is a long time re of insurance company. Yeah, uh, but based, uh, based in Jersey. Yeah, but but uh, says like they're, an they're, encyclopedia. They have... Tom. He knows everything about everybody. Watch <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. Trump's getting his Trump is getting his money from his donors. Right. Yeah. You know, he's up front about it. You know, he, the donors, and I get lots of of, of, of email from, from, from Trump. I actually got an email from Giuliani, too, asking for money. Oh, boy. You know, and that's because I was a registered Republican in 2012 to vote the, in the presidential primary. And I've been getting their, their emails ever since. And they're just pumping and pumping and pumping for more cash. Yeah. So yeah, and all that's going, so Trump is going to pay his legal bills. Yeah. yeah, but look, the, the, I don't think Sheldon Avinson or his wife is is going to pay for his legal bills. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, I mean, I've heard, I've seen reports that he is being shunned by 
the major Republican donor. That's oh, why uh, he lost. He lost the. He lost the brothers, the Koch brothers. You yeah, know, he lost he the Koch family. Yeah, they, they won't give him any money either. So you know, because yeah. he's, he's he's he's. Let's be uh, honest. Cool. What is he? What does he come down to to raise money? Selling souvenirs. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the shoes His or it's the GoFundMe is not raising uh, money at the rate of the interest on uh, the yeah. five hundred million or so that he owes. That he owes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they, he's not even raising enough to cover the interest on the payment. Yeah. So I mean, it. it, it all I'm saying is, is that uh, uh, I, d I don't think the I think, you know, there could be some Russian money in there on, under the table that I don't know. But uh, to accuse an American company of being in league with the Russians is something I don't wish to do on this program because I'm going to have to pay for the lawyers. OK, <laughs> and you're not going to have to. You can disappear. Right. You can just say, I, I, had, I don't know who Alex Bennett is. And, uh, you know, or, you or can... just just get us the, uh, you know, get us the, the documentation, you know, where you saw this. You know, I mean, uh, yeah. the, well, the problem, uh, the problem, the problem... Seth Abramson has a sub stack that you can go and he's well, well documented well, everything no, well, with they, all the links. He, he, somebody can well document it. He can still screw up the, the documentation. The point I'm making is, is that uh, uh, you know it, we, we always get into these conspiracy theories, and I think you got to steer clear of them and stick with the facts. You know, I just think that. Uh, We've gotten to that point. I mean, I used to be a conspiracy theorist too, and you know, you go out and you believe all this stuff. And and the fact of the matter is, over the years, I found that most of those conspiracy theories never held water, never. And that's why I've stopped going for them. I want, I want you. I, look, Trump's a bad human being. He's a bad hombre. Hmm. That's all we should need to have to say about him. And people who, if they were intelligent in this country, would see it. You know, I mean, uh, here, here, here are, are people who are, are Christians who consider themselves good Christians who think he's a good Christian in spite of the fact that he's had how many wives, cheated on how many of them, you know, uh, likes to grab women on the, by the pussy. You know, I mean, this is not the kind of person that you... Uh, that you was just you, convicted for sexual abuse yeah, by yeah, a jury. Yeah. Found guilty. Yes. By yes, a jury. Absolutely. But they make excuses. Yeah. Oh, well, that's Trump. What? <laughs> you know, that's Trump? <laughs> oh, okay. Let's give him a pass on this. Well, anyway. he gave him three justices on the Supreme Court, and that's what they want. Well, that's what they got. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're stuck with them. Hey, listen, I'm going to play the theme here. I say that because most people don't know when I'm playing the theme because they can't hear it. Uh, but uh, it's been a, it's been been a nice night tonight. We started out with just a, a good lecture from uh, our good friend Josh, and, and then people were added to this, and uh, slowly but surely we got a show. Um, uh, Amy's not on tonight, right? Because nope. because she didn't break in her equipment when she should have. That's yeah. IA. That's not really Amy. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's AI, you mean, AI, not AI. AI, yeah, AI, yeah, AI, AI, whatever. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm sure your your people will miss you, although some of them are here right now, so, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and I'll miss the show, too. So, anyway, we'll, we'll put on last night's show right after this. And uh, I hope you can get that whole thing working, because it'd be really nice when you want to leave town that you can do a show. And uh, probably it's just yeah. a matter of you spending time with it and, yeah, it's it. I just got to figure out how that little mixer works. I, I have a small mixer. Yeah. But I sent it to Mike, and then Mike died, and I never got it back. Oh, okay. Well, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, Mike died. Which Mike who? Mike Gower. Oh, did we finally? Was find, that confirmed? Was it confirmed that he's dead? Pretty much. Or just pretty assume. Much. Well, pretty much, but I mean, does anybody know he's dead for sure? Anyway. Well, uh, the neighbor thought, said he was oh, dead. Yeah, yeah oh, the neighbor, neighbor said he was dead. Oh, okay. When I went up there, he had a neighbor that said he was dead. So. Oh, okay. 
good. Nice to be here. Or at least they wished he was dead. Anyway, thanks to to Josh, and thanks uh, to Amy. Pleasure to have you here, Amy. Uh, Tom, always, you know, anytime. Uh, Alan, always, anytime. Well, almost anytime. Uh, And uh, (laughs) uh, Kevin, thank you for being here. And, of course, Charlie, what were you, you got in late? You look tired. You look exhausted. You must have been working. Yeah, Yeah. everybody, give a big wave goodbye, and I will give a big wave goodbye at you, and uh, say there they go, folks. Our citizen panel. Yes, sir. That's them. And uh, there's not going to be Amy Manuel tonight. There's not going to be an intersection because uh, Amy couldn't get her uh, uh, remote equipment working, but I'm sure she will in the future. But she'll be back again here on on Wednesday. Uh, I'm Alex Bennett. That's it for tonight. We'll play a rerun of the uh, intersection. And uh, we'll see you on Monday with the uh, pop-up show, which will be on a broadcast on or podcast or whatever the cast is. Um, um, on, um, I'm trying to think now. What was I going to say? Well, anyway. Uh, We'll be on on Monday, and then we'll be back again on Wednesday, same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody. See you later.